Have you ever seen the Siberian lynx? Or this beautiful bumblebee species? You probably have not seen them because they are highly endangered species. And sadly, they join the ranks of many species around the globe that are endangered. Just last week, a global assessment was published representing the scientific view of hundreds of scientists, and it was ratified by hundreds of countries. And in this uh, assessment, they have estimated that 25% of global species are now threatened. About one million species face extinction in the coming decades. And this is a crisis of unprecedented proportions. We don't hear so much about the biodiversity crisis, but it's just as big as the climate change problem. So what is happening? What is unraveling the fabric of life? There are many contributors, but land use change is the biggest one. And how we farm is extremely important within land use change as a factor affecting biodiversity. And why should we care about biodiversity loss? Well, first is the fact that each species is the product of a unique evolutionary path of innovations, if you will, uh, to lead to the marvelous adaptations that each species shows. And the second is that we depend on biodiversity for our, our own survival. From the millions of microbes in the soil that create soil fertility, even to our own microbiome that people are finding out now is so critical to our health to the bee species that pollinate our crops, and to the ecosystems that provide us with uh, fresh water and that regulate our climate. We depend on nature's services for our own survival, and nature's services in turn depend on biodiversity. So I've been a biodiversity scientist working on protecting species for pretty much my entire career. And that career started in Madagascar in 1988. And at that time, I was involved in helping the government identify uh, the best areas to protect Madagascar's endangered flora and fauna. Most of these species are endemic, uh, and that means found only on Madagascar. And some of the good news is that over the past 50 years, we have made a tremendous increase in the amount and the size of, protected, of the protected area estate. So we now protect over 22 million square kilometers. But the question is, is that enough? It turns out that beyond these endangered species, even some common species are declining. This is a harbinger of things to come the common species today are going to be the endangered species of tomorrow. So what should we do? Our protected areas are vital, but what do we need to do to complement this protected area strategy? I believe that we need to also protect biodiversity in the spaces that are shared by people in nature. In other words, what we call our working landscapes, where we farm, where we grow livestock, where we extract forest products. Because this region, the working lands, are so much larger than our protected areas. Right now, we protect about 15% of the terrestrial land surface, but our working lands are certainly more than 50% of the terrestrial land surface. So what do we need to do? We need to transform from these very intensive industrialized forms of land management, like monoculture farming, for example, to, a much, more diverse, to much more diversified forms of land management. Uh, this picture shows diversified agriculture. And these need to be forms of management that are biodiversity-based and that uh, depend on nature services for their production, as well as supporting biodiversity. An example is silvopasture. So in silvopasture, uh, the ranchers integrate woody vegetation, both shrubs and trees, into the pasture lands. And they have uh, a number of sources of forage, the grasses, the shrubs, and the trees, all are palatable. The diversity of the plantings are key. This diverse forage improves the nutrition and also the health of the animals, leading to high meat and milk production. But in addition, the trees provide shade for the animals, which improves their welfare. 
and uh, also store carbon, which helps these systems to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, adding structure to the landscape provides habitat for birds and other organisms. And these are regenerative systems as well. The manure from the livestock goes back into the soil, supplying nutrients. Some of the shrubs are nitrogen fixing, and so the farmers actually don't need to use fertilizer. And then finally, they are, they're deep-rooted species that bring carbon into the soil and also infiltrate the water into the soil. And thus, these systems are fertile and drought resilient, which is extremely important as we approach a, more, uh, a, a future with greater climate extremes. Here's a picture of silvopasture in Colombia. In the background, you see an older planted silvopasture with the large trees. In the foreground, you see a recent seeding where grass forage has been integrated to restore soils degraded by year after year after year of monoculture agriculture. And there are remnant native tree species. And then in the background, you see a silvopasture that's actually taking place in the native forest. So underneath the canopy there, there are livestock. Same place, some years later, you see a lot more trees in the foreground. A lot of restoration has happened. And you also see some other patches. The red outline shows a new seeded area with uh, remnant tropical trees. And what's happening is that over time, they're actually growing back the forest in a way that builds connections, builds connectivity into the landscape. And for biodiversity, this is so critical. Because when we don't have connectivity in the landscape, then uh, species populations become isolated. They become genetically inbred, and this can contribute to, uh, their, um, to their extinction probability. And so we really need this connectivity to restore gene flow and allow or, uh, organisms to move around the landscape. Even more so because with climate change, uh, the habitats are actually shifting. The ranges of organisms are shifting, and the organisms need to follow and track their climate niches, both northwards and upwards. So I'm going to show you a comparison between grass monoculture and silvopasture. Milk, two times more productive. Meat, two times more productive, or a little bit more than that. And much less uh, pesticide is needed to control ticks. Uh, because there are natural enemies in the environment that are controlling them. No fertilizers are being used. And be the combination of that means more production, less inputs need to be purchased. This is a more profitable system. In addition, more than double the carbon sequestration compared to grass monoculture. Much higher uh, species richness of birds. And much less land is being used for the production of of a ton of meat. That's because the stocking rates are actually higher in the silvopastoral system. So, in the sum, the silvopasture is more productive, more sustainable, and more pr profitable while providing these important biodiversity benefits. So, it's possible to think about these kinds of methodologies even in the most intensively farmed areas, such as the U.S. Corn Belt. Here, some farmers are integrating small strips of prairie on 10% of their land. And this photo, we get down into that prairie strip. You can see all of the uh, diversity of prairie uh, flowering plants. It's bringing back some, bird, uh, some prairie bird species and a variety of other organisms as well. So comparing the prairie strips with the monoculture corn, we have great benefits for biodiversity, two to four times more plant diversity, bee diversity, and bird diversity. But interestingly, because of the deep-rooted prairie plants, these prairie strips are able to hold on to the nitrogen, the phosphorus from the fertilizer, and the soils. If without these prairie strips, all of this would be washing into the Mississippi River and contributing to the terrible dead zone that we have in the Gulf of Mexico from over-fertilization. However, there is an issue. They're taking 10% of the land out of production, and so they are producing less corn. These are the kinds of trade-offs that we have to deal with and come up with solutions to in order to encourage these more sustainable approaches. 
So what kinds of things can we do? What can contribute? Certainly, government can play a role by creating an enabling policy environment, by providing incentives, um, or by regulating bad actors. Markets can also play a role by making transparent to consumers through certification programs which uh, farmers are doing the right thing, which, which farmers are, are stewarding in this manner. But perhaps the most promising is the actions of civil society itself through grassroots activities, community engagement, and social movements, we find promising examples around the world. So to sum up, these kinds of more diversified, nature-based methods are critical to provide connectivity uh, so that we can promote organisms' ability to adapt to climate change and to resist uh, genetic inbreeding. They can provide a little bit more habitat for all of those other species with whom we share the planet. They can reduce the negative effects of agriculture, uh, such as pollutants. And then finally, they can enhance and sustain the production and livelihood of the many uh, families that are operating these farming and ranching and forestry operations. Thank you.